I seen through like five seconds or something. I don't remember. But Kirk, thanks for coming on. Appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me again. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Uh, sure, Tom. Uh, thanks for having me here uh, or having me back. I enjoyed our first couple of episodes there a while back and um, looking forward to this one. Uh, about myself, uh, I guess, you know, I'm a philosopher as well as a scientist, as well as a theologian, I guess. And so I am especially interested in questions pertaining to the interaction of those uh, three areas in life or three areas of thought. And uh, did a master's in philosophy, uh, specializing in the problem of evil. Published a few papers and philosophy journals on that one, and then uh, did a PhD in uh, biophysics, looking at the um, information encoded in genomes and what it does in terms of uh, protein structure and so forth. But um, also, I mean, my main interest is just talking about these things, researching them and writing and discussing them. And I've done a lot of that over the years. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I like outdoors, you know, canoeing, remote wilderness stuff. Uh, married, six kids, all married. I like indoors. Outdoors is too cold. <laughs> yeah, this time of year it is a little, a little cold. So we were going to talk about God of the Gaps arguments. And I think your article was about how the accusation of God of the gaps arguments by atheists is not appropriate or something along those lines or how they're not. Well, you know, gaps you know, I've, I've um, kind of been thinking about this a lot in the last week or so. And I've actually, uh, for the listeners, they can refer to the article. It's simply on Kirk <clears throat> I'm just coming off a cold here. So, and they can look at that argument if they want. But I wouldn't, I don't want to accuse the atheists or the skeptics of being unreasonable here. I personally felt my article, my original article, was a little loose, needed to be tightened up. But in, in reality, I think it's an honest, um, honest assessment that people make. They actually, th you know, uh, and I think that shows that maybe we need to talk about what a God of the gaps argument is um, so that we can then look at arguments and figure out whether those arguments are in that category or not. Could you give an overview or example for the audience who hasn't read your article of um, one of the times you think the God of the gaps criticism would be is commonly used by atheists but shouldn't apply? <clears throat> well, I would say any argument, um, well, first of all, I, I would say that the, the essential ingredient in a God of the gaps argument would be something to the effect of, I don't know of a natural explanation for this particular, uh, phenomenon. Therefore God did it, or maybe they would be a little weaker and they would say, or make a weaker claim and say, therefore, God probably did it. Or if they really want to be cautious, they might say, maybe God did it. And that's the problem with that is that it's an argument from ignorance or lack of knowledge. And uh, the, cri the critics of the argument <clears throat> would come back and say, well, they, they, have a, they make an assumption as well. Or let's call it a premise. And the premise is that when we have a gap in knowledge to explain something, um, as we gain our knowledge in how nature works, that gap is usually filled in. And uh, there's quite a bit of warrant for that premise. And so uh, that's my summary of what a God of the gaps argument is. But I would say when it's not a God of the gaps argument, that occurs when it's not an argument from the absence of information or an argument from ignorance, but it's an argument uh, from data or from information from knowledge that would be one uh case where it's not a god of the gaps argument the other one is well, there's two key aspects of this this whole approach and one key aspect is that it's an argument from ignorance that's the problem of the guy promoting that argument but the problem of the person who wants to respond to the argument is this assumption that there is a natural explanation and Normally, I think there's pretty good warrant for that premise. 
maybe not all the time, but there is certainly, for example, in pre-Socratic times, lightning hits a tree, scares the living daylights out of some guy walking down the road. And he says, I have no idea what did that, but it was the gods, you know, so they would attribute that to the gods. But obviously, we thoroughly understand, uh, I think, at least in physics, we did a section of our course on how lightning works and electric fields and so forth are involved with it. And we can even reproduce it in the lab. So there's a case where uh, that assumption that if we don't know what did it, therefore the gods did it or God did it, um, has been falsified. And it's been falsified a lot, at least if you compare what the ancient Greeks used to believe. So uh, the other time when it would not be a God of the gaps argument or when we need to question is if the premise itself of the critic starts looking a little sketchy. Let's say the more we learn, the bigger the gap gets. Or the more we learn about nature, the smaller the probability gets that it could have caused that. That doesn't prove, therefore, God did it. But what it does do is say, maybe we have a, a situation here where um, we can't really accuse, you know, falsify the argument, um, the God of the gaps argument, but we can't really verify the premise that nature will fill that in. <coughs> Excuse me. So the second one definitely seems very suspicious, suspicious to me because mm -hmm. it seems like the bigger the gap is, it's still a God of the gaps argument. I don't think the size of the gap would be relevant in any way to make the assumption that God did it more relevant. Even if you mm -hmm. say lower the probability of a known natural explanation causing a particular event, that wouldn't increase the probability that a supernatural or God-based explanation would cause be the cause of the thing. And so that one would still also seem to be like a God of the gaps. So I definitely don't think the second case would invalidate it from being a God of the gaps. Yeah, I, I can see your point there. And I think that if um, if the person is still saying, we don't know what did this, therefore God did it, it still qualifies as a God of the gaps argument. But where the problem is, is more in the criticism that the assumption that as we, as we learn more about nature, that gap will be filled in, when in reality, as we learn more about nature, the gap gets bigger and bigger in some cases. And then... Then, you see, the God of the Gaps argument <clears throat> is not a, it doesn't, um, I mean, it's always possible that God did do it. Let's say if there, God did exist and does intervene in this world, there would be events that um, might not be explainable by physics. And therefore, it's, it's possible that God did it. It's just so weak in the face of the warranted assumption that nature will fill that gap of knowledge in. That's the problem with the God of the gaps. <clears throat> so I think, let's say, I would agree with you that as the gap gets wider, as science advances and it's getting, the creative stories get more preposterous all the time, that um, it doesn't change the fact that it's a God of the gaps argument. But on the other hand, God of the gaps argument is not automatically false just because uh, they conclude, unless they're making a strong claim that if we don't know what did it, then God did it as a universal claim. That's always the case when obviously that has been falsified centuries ago, thoroughly falsified. So the strong claim is definitely a fallacious argument, right, I mean, but it doesn't uh, really get you anywhere. The fallacy fallacy, where you say there's a fallacy in an argument, therefore the conclusion is false. Simply because an argument is fallacious doesn't prove the conclusion wrong. It just proves That's that right. the argument itself isn't a valid justification for the conclusion. Yeah. And so in that case, I think that I would agree with you that if someone said that because your argument is a God of gaps, therefore the conclusion must necessarily be wrong, that would be a fallacy fallacy and wouldn't be justified. Um, the part where I would disagree is I think in the case of the widening of the gap. So like if we have a tool that has worked to some degree um, and that tool is not successfully accomplishing some 
goal of solving some problem or whatever. And then it's getting harder and harder to solve the problem. If there's no other tool that has ever succeeded, then you couldn't say because this tool is getting less and less accurate or whatever. Therefore, any of these other tools which have never worked have a higher likelihood of being true because that would not be the case. It would be um, like saying you have 10 broken axles or whatever, or um, nine, say you have nine broken axles and you don't know if the 10th is broken or not. Showing that the first nine are broken doesn't increase the probability that the ninth is not broken. It could still also be, or the 10th is also broken, it could still also be broken. And so even if we know our current compass, our current tool is broken or is not working, that does not increase the probability of any of the other tools not being broken. And so even if the, the gap is widening and this tool may not be the right tool for the job, that wouldn't indicate another tool like supernatural or God by extension. I, yeah. I mean, um, I think I agree with you there, Tom, if I understood you correctly, I don't see a problem with that on the face of it. I think the, the time when, <clears throat> when it's definitely not a God of the gaps argument it, or is when, it's logically impossible for nature to fill that gap. Then where logical impossibility is, um, means that it really is absolutely impossible. Even if we knew nothing about physics, we know a priori that it's logically impossible. Then it would not be a God of the gaps argument. Although uh, even then I would not frame the argument as we don't know what did it, therefore God did it. What I would think be more accurate is one of my arguments I supply in my article is, and this may be the only case where we could say it's logically impossible for nature to do it, would be um, <clears throat> the origin of nature, where I define nature as the entirety of material reality, space, time, matter, and energy. Um, and that would include multiverses if there are such things, the complete entirety of material reality. So the origin of material reality or nature must be either natural or not natural. But it's logically impossible for the origin of nature to be natural. It violates the law of non-contradiction. Therefore, there must be a non-material reality that caused the origin of nature or non-natural reality that caused the origin of nature. That would not be a God of the gaps argument as I've been accused of, uh, as sometimes people will say it is. Rather, it's an argument based on what we know with absolute certainty. And when I say absolute certainty, <coughs> there's not a whole lot that we could actually claim to know with absolute certainty. And uh, just off the top of my head, I think the only thing and this is from my training in philosophy, that we can know with absolute certainty are things that are logically necessary or logically impossible. Where there's we know a priori there's there's it's not going to happen in any possible world because it violates the fundamental axioms of logic. That may be the only argument I can think of that people do label as a God of the gaps argument but actually isn't because it's not logically possible for nature to fill that gap. I don't even talk about a gap there. It's a, what's called in, in logic a disjunctive syllogism where you have a true dichotomy, A or B. It's not A, so we only have two possibilities, and A is imp logically impossible. It has to be B, regardless of what its implications might be. So my one concern with that is that any... God of the gaps argument that you that you phrase can be rephrased as an argument from impossibility, um, and in which case they're simply taking the fundamental God of the gaps argument and caking it over with some kind of layer to make it hidden that it's a God of the gaps argument. So I could say, oh, we don't know what caused the lightning on the tree, therefore Zeus did it. Or I can say it's logically impossible for anything except Zeus to cause the lightning, therefore Zeus did it. <laughs> Now, the yeah. way I phrase the argument, it's not structured in such a way that it's a God of the gaps, but it's still a God of the gaps. It's still just taking the God of the gaps and reframing it, covering it up with some semantics. And it <clears throat> seem like it's not a God of the gaps. I would say we would have to take a look at that argument. I would, I would rephrase the argument as a disjunctive syllogism. So, uh, because they would say, 
one of the things one has to do if they're going to say it's logically impossible, they have to back that up. And it has to be backed up with logic. Uh, because once we're talking about logical impossibilities or logical necessities, we can't just say, you know, this is logically impossible or that's logically necessary. It, it has to boil. We have to show from the axioms of logic themselves. When I, and, and maybe I should clarify what I mean by an axiom. An axiom is a fundamental truth from which we reason. It's uh, impossible to derive such a thing or to prove such a thing is true without using the axiom in your proof. Um, my logic prof pointed that out a long time ago, the principle of logical inference. We cannot prove that those are true without using the principles of logical inference in our proof. So if some guy says it's logically impossible for anything but Zeus to have produced that, I would just sit back and say, explain that. I, I'm really interested. Like Socrates often asked, you know, uh, tell me more about this because it's, I don't see any way it's logically impossible for something else to produce it other than Zeus. Oh, sure. I, I, I would understand. totally agree. <coughs> <coughs> so my Sorry. only contention was there is that you can take a God of the gaps argument and reframe it in such a way that it appears to not be a God of the gaps argument. And so even though something may follow the strict, may not follow the strict um, orientation of a God of the gaps, I don't know, therefore X or whatever, it can still be fundamentally a God of the gaps. So that was my only point there. And so in the case of your argument about nature can't be its own origin, one, I would, I'd probably nitpick about um, the cyclic, cyclic cycle. So it's technically logically possible if time reverses like that in some case, but granting that, nature can't be the origin of itself kind of a thing. We can just say it doesn't have an origin. And so in the same way that the Zeus must have saying it's logically necessary that Zeus must have uh, caused the lightning bolt. We can say that the same kind of flaw exists in the, in the argument you presented because it assumes nature has an origin. Well, okay. Uh, and, and that is a whole nother line of discussion, which, you know, my, my point was, is that this isn't when in my, this article here, I refer to that argument, but I say, if you want to go into the details, go over there. All I want to figure out is, is this a God of the gaps argument or not? And in general, <clears throat> um, one cannot just, um, I, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a very important. My supervisor pounded this into my head and, philosophy will treat you very harshly if you violate this ethical principle is that whenever I see someone's argument, I have to accurately frame it. So, and we're not free to just frame it however we want. So if there is, if it is actually a God of the gaps argument in disguise, we should be able to logically show or produce a syllogism that shows that it is. Now, there is something you mentioned there that I think I need to address, and that is argument from impossibility. Okay. Um, I, it really it really depends on what a person means by impossibility. Do they just mean it's extremely improbable? Because that is not logical impossibility. If it's extremely improbable, there's still a probability that it could occur. And then, but an argument from improbability is uh, those occur a lot and they're described as abductive arguments. That is an argument to the best explanation. And I know you're familiar with this, Tom, and I, but I, just in case some of the listeners aren't familiar with terms like abductive argument, probability really does count when it comes to, well, what's the best explanation? And on another um, area where probability counts in, in logical arguments is inductive arguments. In fact, uh, you know, which is likely, it's not the best argument, but for example, um, William Rowe, an atheist William Rowe said, um, no good we know of uh, justifies God in permitting certain evils. And if we don't know of a good, then we can then make an inductive move to assert that there is no good that justifies God in permitting these certain evils. And since a God, a real God would never allow 
gratuitous evil, therefore the real God doesn't exist. That is an example of an inductive argument because it makes an inductive move. And he states that himself. He makes that inductive move. And then everybody argues about whether the inductive mood was justified or not justified. And, it, and they often actually haul out Bayes' theorem and talk about probabilities in these discussions. But anybody who's going to say it's impossible or it's improbable, they have to defend that. And, and, they, and they can be grilled on that. They can be questioned on that. So um, it's not necessarily a God of the gaps argument it then becomes an inductive argument that one is challenging one of the data or the premises, or it's an abductive argument saying, no, that's not the best explanation. And here are my reasons why this other thing might be the best explanation. So I, I don't want to be associated with those guys over there who make these arguments from improbability or impossibility and say, therefore, maybe God exists or something. Those have to be treated very carefully. And I, I, I'd be hesitant to throw my lot in with them. Oh, yeah, I, I would agree. So I was going back to your um, objection to the it's logically necessary that Zeus caused the lightning bolt argument. You said, well, that doesn't make sense because you'd have to defend the claim that it was logically necessary that nothing else could have done it. And you can't justify that. It's clearly just a God of the gaps that's been caked over by this other argument. And I was making a parallel between that and the argument you made were that you claim that nature had a beginning. It seems like a unjustified assumption that is baked into that argument in the same sense that the assumption that only Zeus logic is logically necessary that Zeus caused a lightning bolt kind of a thing. Or it's an unjustified assumption that has been placed in there in order to construct a non-God of the gaps argument. But the foundation of that one assumption is the the part that seems to be the entire crux of the argument it's like this argument only works if that assumption is defended and if that assumption can't be defended well then the whole argument is just a god of the gaps based off of this one kernel that hasn't been addressed well okay the i would disagree that well let's let's take a look at that alternate argument it would have to be framed as such <clears throat> Either the cause of that lightning bolt was um, something natural or Zeus did it. So it's a true, it, it's a, okay, it's being framed as a dichotomy right off the bat. I think it's a false dichotomy. Like, why Zeus? Where did you get that from? And then the second premise could say it's logically impossible. Let's say nature. Let's say it was either natural or Zeus did it. It's, logic, it's logically impossible for nature to do it. Again, there'd be a serious problem with that one as well. How in the world? What, what law of logic is violated by um, if nature wants to produce lightning bolts? There, there, there are none, none that I'm aware of. So they would not be able to defend premise one. It's a false dichotomy. They would not be able to defend premise two because they can't even show that it's logically impossible for um, nature to produce the lightning bolt. And this is why I say there may be only, I could be wrong here, but there may be only one argument. And that has to do with the origin of nature itself, where it, uh, where it works. Oh, you disappeared oh, for a moment. Yeah, I think, I think that was my fault. One second, let me refresh and try that again. I'm back and I think you're working. All right, we're good. We're good. All right, keep going. Good, was I? Yeah, I, I should apologize for my voice. Like, don't worry. I know some of you said, I hope the guy survives or something. Um, I was, it was a two day cold last week, but after a two day cold, it, <clears throat> all that congestion and bad voice takes a while. So that's why I'm taking frequent swigs of coffee here. Yeah, I don't know. I, um, any, so uh, now if the argument fails, like that Greek guy, it, uh, his argument would fail miserably on both, both premises. Then he might have to fall back to a God of the gaps argument. And then we could nail him on, well, actually, I know how lightning works and it's, it's entirely nature. So he's in trouble. Uh, but there were two different arguments there. That's what I'm trying to say. One was not a gaps, it, not a God of the gaps. It was a disjunctive syllogism, but a bad one and then he that didn't work so then he has to fall back so i, I wouldn't say it's caked over 
Although you could argue that maybe he doesn't want it. He knows about God of the gaps arguments. He doesn't do it. Then he comes up with this disjunctive syllogism, which itself is not a wrong move. It's a valid move. Philosophers are always trying to figure out how to come up with this argument here because that one over there is obviously not going to work. But uh, it's not caked over. It's an alternate approach. And the alternate approach fails miserably. Then he falls back to the God of the gaps argument. That obviously has been falsified, and he's toast. So how would that be different than the case of saying the, the assumption that nature must have an origin, then nature can't be the cause of its own origin, therefore something outside of nature must did it. Why would the assumption that nature must have an origin mm -hmm. be any less dubious than the lightning bolt example? Yeah, well, actually, this I whether nature, see, one of the, you've, 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 You've pinpointed a, a valid objection to that argument, but it's not a God of the, because it's a God of the gaps argument. It's, well, what if nature didn't have a beginning? So then if it doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have to have anything cause it to come into existence. It's always existed and so forth. Well, that's a different discussion, but I have an article that addresses that. And my, my very quick response is... First to say that <clears throat> it doesn't show that the argument itself is a God of the gaps argument. All it shows is that there's a hidden premise or it's based on the premise that nature did have a beginning. And my response to that is that um, when we look at the choices available to it, is that is nature um, has been around for an infinite amount of time, accountable infinite amount of time. Well, then we have to haul out the accents of mathematics. And we know from mathematics and infinite set theory, specifically a property of a countable infinite set, that in reality, you can't work your way through an infinite past and get to our conversation tonight. And there's a property that we know about it, that we know about, or that's part of that um, infinite set theory. And that is, if you have a countable infinite set of, let's say, past years or past cycles, and you have to work your way through all of them before you get to this conversation tonight. Well, if you remove, you can't, there's no starting point. That's a bit of a problem right there. So let's just start anywhere and not worry about what order we remove them from. As long as we get them all taken care of so that we can have this conversation tonight. Well, it turns out that if we remove a, um, any finite number from a countable infinite set and the cardinality of a cardinal cardinal the cardinality of a countable infinite set there's a symbol because no integer every integer is finite it's just called lf null so lf null minus any finite number still equals lf null so you never ever get to this conversation tonight the mere fact we're here means that the past number of cycles or multiverse um, sequences or um, a number of years in the past that this was a one-off deal necessarily has to be finite. And we're not using data for that. It boils down to mathematics. And mathematics itself, we can question, uh, did we make up these axioms or not? So you have to look at what are the fundamental axioms, the first principles of math. And if we can agree on those, and that's what our whole mathematical system is based on, then you do reach the point where, in reality, the past has to be finite, no matter what scenario you put on it. Not in mathematical models, though. In mathematical models where you don't actually have to spend one certain amount of time going through a particular cycle to get to the next cycle, where you can treat the, the countable infinite as a, as a object, a mathematical object, you can... We do it all the time when we integrate from zero, minus infinity to plus infinity. We treat infinity as an object. That's no problem. The problem is when you actually have to plod your way through an infinite number of past years or cycles before we can have our conversation tonight. That's when everything changes. So uh, that's just a quick argument, in case I lost anybody, as to why we can't escape a beginning for, the, for material reality if time is involved. Well, so I, I mean, I would reject that because I mean, most physicists reject that. It's only, it only applies in a theory of time where the present moment is contingent 
on the past moment or the past moment causes the present moment. And that's essentially just not how time works or not the consensus of how time works. So for example, if we had a spectrum of moments, um, so say there's a, an infinite set of moments from T minus infinity to T plus infinity, um, but there's some mechanism to say we start at 47. Well, then there's no, there's no problem with starting at 47. It's just the problem just disappears. So there can be a present moment at any of the given instances, and there could be an infinite number of moments behind them as long as there's just some mechanism to say, well, we just started at this one, this finite number, and there's a finite number. To well, that. then we, uh, there's a couple of things to say about theory. Oh, what, before, before you go to that, yeah. the main point I was making was not about the time thing. It was about the fact that I can take any God of the gaps argument and add this assumption of a logical necessity so i can say um there is a magic potato uh there or maybe maybe there is a a magic creator a magic potato that was created by zeus it is logically necessary that zeus created this potato because it's by definition a magic potato that's created by zeus therefore because this exists zeus must exist now clearly there's if there's no magic potato created by zeus i just added this in with no evidence um I could take my God of the gaps argument and of the tree Zeus creating lightning to the tree and say, well, actually, because there's this logical necessity that Zeus exists and it can't be the alternative because of the existence of the potato. Therefore, it's not a God of the gaps argument. And so we can take any God of the gaps arguments, insert a logical necessity of some dubious claim like a magic potato or the beginning of nature or whatever, and cake it in such a way that all such God of the gaps arguments can be made into some logical necessity entailment. And so it's more that simply phrasing the argument in that way doesn't stop it from being a God of the gaps because any argument can do so. And then I would also agree that you'd have to justify um, the premise and then your argument attempts to do that. But I would say that it isn't successful in doing that. So like if in the case of a God of the gaps, you take a dubious claim like there is a magic potato created by Zeus and so necessarily Zeus must have created it or whatever. Even if you believe there is some justification for that, if it doesn't ultimately work, then I think the argument would still necessarily be a God of the gaps that was just caked in this perceived better argument. Even if you believe that better argument, if it ultimately doesn't work, then I don't think it would technically qualify as a new kind of argument i think it would just be some kind of thing caked on to the god of the gaps and so it'd still be justified for the agency no it's still just a god of the gaps okay well um correct me if i'm misunderstanding at any point but um i think we might agree that if the ancient greek guy just makes up this thing asserts that it's logically necessary such and such that uh, I think we would agree that that would fail if he can't show how that follows from certain basic axioms of logic. It's just an assertion. And uh, the, the rigor is probably no tighter rigor known to humanity than logic or maybe mathematics. They're two very closely related things and we're not free just to say it's logically necessary that this magic potato here is created by Zeus, that <laughs> he'd have a lot of work on his hands to show how that follows from certain logical axioms. But your second point, let's see, you're more, um, I'm trying to remember what, you went from there to, oh, you don't think the argument works. So, so then what we have to do, if we don't think the argument works, let's take that uh, origin of nature one. We're, we're granting, or I'm granting, for the sake of the argument that nature had a beginning. And, you know, we can set that aside whether it did or not. And, and I acknowledge that, that is a discussion. So let's just grant for the sake of the argument. The question is, is this argument a God of the gaps argument? And we look at premise one, uh, if it's a true dichotomy, we have to grant that. Now we could argue about whether it is a true dichotomy. Is there a third option? Because the moment you have a third option, then what's presented as a true dichotomy has been falsified. There's maybe a spectrum of options. But when you're talking about natural, not natural, it's very difficult to come up with a third option. So when we, we say, I reject that argument or I don't accept it, we have to do that on some logical basis. We have to show that one of the premises is 
is false or at least um, unacceptable. You know, it's it's um, so premise one looks like a true dichotomy. Premise two, it's logically impossible for nature to bring itself into existence. That appears to be necessarily true or logically true. And if those two premises are true, then the conclusion logically follows. Having set aside the question of whether there was a beginning to the universe. So it's not in nowhere has there a premise been, we don't know what caused it. We still might not know what caused it on either case. The scientists might not know. There's a lot of stuff scientists don't know. And there's a, but it doesn't, um, let me see, let me try and make this succinct. Yeah, we, all we, sh- all the argument shows, it doesn't show that God did it or Zeus or anything else. All it shows is that the cause of nature must be not natural. And for other examples, I know people would say, well, what do you mean by not natural? I would say, well, the axioms of logic, for example, which I think a lot of us agree that their fundamental reality, they, they are without the axioms of logic and math, we'd be in deep trouble. So, but they're not material. They're not measurable in any sense of terms of space, time, matter, and energy, they operate independent of that, nor are they determined by the laws of physics. In fact, they seem to be more fundamental than the laws of physics. For example, laws of physics won't even work without the more fundamental causal principle, which applies both in logic and we see by extension into material reality. I think think logic is an interesting discussion, but my point that I'm trying to get, I think, is that in physics, the argument, the infinite regress argument from numbers is as rejected as the magic Zeus potato. Like physicists just like, that's not a thing. It's never been a thing that's easily debunked by simply saying, nope, here's the alternative. Um, you have some selecting mechanism. There can be an infinite past event and an infinite future it's points in time that go completely infinitely, countably infinitely uncountably if it doesn't make a difference and as long as you have some kind of a selector to pick a particular point in time to start the chain of present moments then there's no problem with having a present moment at any of the given times in any of the spectrums um at which point the argument fails so the argument is as logically demonstrably false as the magic potato kind of a thing is the analogy i'm going for in which case because this argument is essentially wholesale rejected in physics um Using it seems to be, from my perspective, as dubious as saying there's a magic potato created by Zeus. Logically, because it's by, by definition, uh, Zeus created this magic potato. It's necessary that Zeus created the magic potato kind of a thing. And so from my perspective, that argument seems equally as bad as the magic potato argument because it's so wholesalely rejected in physics because of a very seemingly obvious alternative that shows it's not a logical necessity or even probable or likely that's the case that there's, you can't have an infinite amount of past events. Okay. Well, I, I, my first degree was in physics before I did the other ones. And then I went into engineering and then philosophy, but I am very familiar with the, the mathematical models for the past in various ways. And I particularly enjoy Sean Carroll and his speculations about the past, but it's, um, what did you say? String theory, his, his string theory, goggly, gobbledy good multiverse EP dot no, yuck. Well, um, that's not the only thing. Like he talks about a, a lot. There's a lot of models where T goes from minus infinity to plus infinity or minus infinity to this point here. But the question is not whether, let's say we can place a point a finite time ago and just work from here. The question is whether or not, um, you see, it, it, it's, I would con- I would say it's simply not, but I'll qualify my, my assertion here. It's not true that it's wholesale rejected by physicists. What is true is that the physicists who think only in terms of mathematical models don't even think about this problem of how in reality do we transverse this. Now, you could say, let's say it's minus 45. Let's pick a point and say we came from minus 45. But the real thing we're concerned about was, well, was there a beginning? Not what did we make one up, you know, 45 years ago or 45 cycles ago. The real problem is, 
it doesn't dispense with the problem of getting from minus infinity to whatever point we pick as a starting point, 45, or any other point on the thing. If you actually, if you actually treat the past as real. Now, mo almost no physicists in any lecture I listen to or articles that I read treats the past as real. The moment they do, like uh, some of them will say, okay, we do have to have a beginning in reality. But that's the moment they start thinking about is the past real or not. But if you're willing to treat the past as a mathematical construct, then of course there's no problem at all. It, uh, you can pick any number, any finite digit as the integer as a starting point and work your way to this point. But that's, uh, that does not solve the problem. And I've never met a physicist who would actually assert that it does. And I have read some that actually think about this and say it doesn't solve the problem. It, it does not solve the problem with if we're to treat the past as real. And that's what we're worried about here, not mathematical models. Did material reality have a beginning or not? If we treat the past as real, then, then those, those things come into play. Well, so the, my the, argument is like Skydive Phil did a great documentary on this. And he has uh, interviews with several dozen of the top leading physicists who specifically address this argument and say, no, it's just nonsense. Um, but their argument goes something like this. Say the past is real, 100% real. But there's another thing. Time, space and time is a field. And so time being a field doesn't exclude other fields existing. And so if there is a another field that can determine the present moment, then even if there's a past infinite, like B theory of time, for example, where it's all just like a bread loaf, there is a real past infinite there. But if the current present moment can be selected for by some other field, then it doesn't matter if there's an infinite past set. There is no, how did we get from there to here? There's a selector for that. There's this other field literally just picks where the present moment is going to be. And it's not because of there being a past infinite. Those are just irrelevant. If the present moment is not contingent on going through the infinite set of past moments and it's contingent on this other field that can literally just select the present moment then even if the past is real even if time is real even if there's an infinite amount of past times it doesn't matter because this other thing literally just selects this is where we're starting so like i can there are an infinite amount of numbers negative infinity positive infinity but i can pick 47 and you don't bring up the same criticism. Well, how did you get from negative infinity to 47? I didn't. I just picked 47. I don't have to go from negative infinity to 47. And so if there's this other field that can select for the present moment, then it solves the problem in the same way me being able to pick a number um, eliminates the problem of trying to get count from negative infinity to 47. I didn't. I didn't count from negative infinity to 47. I just picked 47. And so this other selector thingy does seem to completely solve the problem to allow the logical possibility of a past infinite and a present moment. And there's no contradiction to getting to the present moment because you didn't start with the negative infinity. Well, I could see two problems with that. Number one is uh, what is doing the selection? Like we're just arbitrarily invoking something, but it can't have a mind because we want to avoid that. We want sure. some sort of a material thing. Okay. So you can't be picking 47. It has to be something immaterial that, or sorry, material of some part of material reality that does the picking or the choosing. Although I hate to use those words because we're implying a mind here, which I am, I'm, I'm amiable to, but we're trying to avoid that problem. The second That's why thing, I mentioned it was a field. It's another field, like a quantum field of some kind. So the choosing part's an analogy, but it's really just another mechanism, like a field that selects the present moment. I guess uh, the second problem is that uh, when the selection is done, that point that was selected, was that point itself contingent on any previous points? Was it contingent or did the curve start there? That's, that's a problem because the, if the other field has to select a point in this field over here, and it's a real field and contingency is important, then uh, that's, that's an issue because then, yeah, we don't have to worry about the beginning. We say it started at 47 because this entity over there picked that. But what we have to then concern ourselves with, well, where did, how did 47 uh, get there? How, did, how was it real? Was it contingent on anything else? If it's not contingent, then it's existed in a timeless state. And I, and I, I don't go with the, um, uh, 
I, I know that treating time as a substance that elapses is handy for us here in this world because it allows us to meet at the same time for our discussion. But I don't actually go with that. I choose to rather that time is um, is measured in terms of of events, and uh, there's no there's nothing between events. But the problem is, is that even the events, there seems to be an arrow of time. That is, the events seem to be, there seems to be some sort of contingency. And that's what our whole system of science is based on. That this, this here, whatever the event, the lightning strike was contingent on the build of an electric field between the cloud and the ground. And that was contingent on there being clouds and there being grounds and planets. And, and it just goes all the way back. But there's a contingency problem there. But I think that's still fine in the, if we, if we measure time in terms of particles, but I think I've digressed. I still see two problems with that. And that is my, that is what I find. Like when I attend a, a lecture um, by a physicist propounding his new theory, or I read a paper, I'm saying, but, but <laughs> where did point number 47 come from? And who's, what is it that's doing the selecting? And sometimes I attended a lecture at the university of Guelph by, um, he works at uh, RIM, not RIM, um, the uh, Pi Institute, Perimeter Institute. Name escapes me at the moment. He had uh, the brain theory. There's membranes. It's kind of like an offshoot of string theory. And I'm listening to this and I'm saying, okay, but um, if we're going to treat these as real, these oscillations as real, there still needs to be beginning. And thankfully, at the very end of his lecture, he says, now, what are the problems? And he is one of the few physicists, he says, came out, yeah, this still, if you're going to treat these things as real, to actually explain this real world, then there has to be, the big question is, well, what caused to this whole vibrating M theory type membranes to, to come into existence? So there's always uh, um, the problem of transferring a mathematical model and theoretical physics, phys physics to reality. And I never thought of that myself. I, I was having a conversation with a cosmologist at the University of British Columbia before I'd actually realized that. And he says the problem with every single mathematical model is that when you try and map them to reality, there's always at least one critical point where it does not map. And Sean Carroll says the same thing. He says, we have lots of mathematical models. Not one of them works in reality because of there's at least one critical point here that won't map to reality. Oh, sure. I'm, I grant that. I For sure, I'm aware of that. But I think the mathematical models are more constrained than our imagination. And so if we're not constraining mm -hmm. our models with the rigor of a mathematical model, then we can imagine it maps to reality when it doesn't in significantly more profound ways than mathematical models. So when I talk about the quantum field, I would agree it's a timeless field. Because time is a field, this thing is not time, so it is a timeless field that exists outside mm -hmm. of time, mm -hmm. and it selected the forty-seven. The forty-seven, all of the points in time have always existed, or exist, um, and this thing simply selected forty-seven due to its nature, quantum decay, mm -hmm. fluctuations, whatever. And this thing is timeless, so I'm I'm happy to grant that there's a timeless mm -hmm. thing which is non-conscious, and it's due to its quantum nature, it selects through whatever features of randomness operate in its nature, 47. And so now we have an alternative hypothesis to nature has no beginning. Even if we grant there is an infinite time, an infinite past or past set of events, there's no logical contradiction with that. And there being a natural thing like a quantum field outside of space time that can, through its nature, select 47. And that doesn't seems to solve the problem of this argument which seems to say it's logically necessary that there must be a uh, not an infinite rest past a series of events or something along those lines in the same way that God is asserted to do so. So God is something asserted to be outside of space time. Therefore um, there isn't a infinite past regression because he started it at some point or whatever. And likewise, you can say there is this thing outside of space time, which selects a particular moment in time, to continue the present moment. And so either way, and obviously I could simply just say the same thing, this thing created time at a, at a finite mm -hmm. beginning as well. But mm -hmm. the point is just to show that the necessity of um, absolute beginning isn't there 
because either way, if we start with something outside of space time, we can have a past infinite regression that just selected the present moment from an infinite set, or it can create it from nothing. And so there isn't this entailment there of this first moment as a requirement if we're already jumping outside of space time to do this spaceless timeless thingy as a part of our hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, actually, I think we're not that far apart, Tom. Um, the difference is you're you're invoking some state of affairs that in a time that exists in a timeless state, and it quote selects let's say forty seven as the beginning point of our material reality. My, uh, I, I, I would say God. There is uh, that's not that far away from the idea that there is a mind outside or independent of space time. Uh, but now the moment I say mind, we now have a mechanism for selecting, whereas you must invoke something about a quantum fluctuation or something like that. But there's a problem with that, that quantum mechanics. Now, I know that there are models that don't use time, but whenever a model comes up in QM that doesn't use time, they always have to substitute some sort of other what's Don, theoretical physicist Don Page, or he's a cosmologist, refers to as a dynamic variable. It's time in disguise. We're just not calling it time. But what it does do is allow a change in states or allow uh, instability so that it could go here or it could go there. But you cannot have uh, any quantum events or a change in states or any instability without a quote, quantum, sorry, a dynamic variable. And we, as soon as we start talking about that, we're talking about time dressed up in different words. And Don Page points that out. Well, I would reject so, that because I think that it, the, I, I agree there's a dynamic variable, but the dynamic variable doesn't need to be time. It just can be a different field. It could be a different field that um, can cause timeless causation. No problem. I don't see why it would be called time in just up in another word or whatever that doesn't seem to follow there's just another field there could be other kinds of fields outside of time that do stuff and that would be perfectly fine but either way that doesn't seem to address the core of the issue which is that um you positing that there is a god outside of space time I can posit there is a quantum field or quantum particle outside of space time. And you said that there is a mechanism of consciousness or choice of some kind that can cause something. But that seems like there's no evidence of that whatsoever. There's no evidence of any timeless minds or consciousnesses that can do things outside of space time. That is, seems like completely baseless as far as I can tell. Whereas saying quantum fields can do things outside of space time, there's lots of evidence of that. There's plethora comparatively of novel predictions that we can make in scientific labs that show, yeah, time as a variable can be, there can be changes outside of time. Essentially that's been demonstrably proven in several papers that we pretty much accept. Yeah. There can be changes outside of time before time, after time, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I believe that's the consensus in physics right now from several discoveries that were made in the past year. Um, but there's no such discovery in physics that consciousness can do anything even remotely similar to this. And so while I agree that the criterion that you want is that there needs to be a mechanism to cause this supposed change outside of space time, that's a valid criterion of the two contenders consciousness versus quantum particles. It seems like there is no basis to conclude consciousness is even a possibility any more than a pineapple or, or a potato or something being a potential thing that could exist outside of space time and cause things. Whereas quantum fields and quantum particles seem to have an abundance of reasons to think, yeah, this is, there's a, this can possibly do stuff outside of space time based on the physics. And so given your own criteria, if we need some kind of a mechanism, it seems infinitely more probable that these quantum particles would be the culprit or the mechanism to cause such a timeless state to go or to create a time state rather than a consciousness doing so because as far as we know we have no evidence of consciousness outside of physical brains and so it would be equivalent to saying a pineapple or potato caused the event well um this is kind of tangential to uh, what you just said, but um, 
and it might lead off to rabbit trails. So we don't have to go there, but we we are aware that there are conscious entities in the universe. Uh, I presume you and I would agree that we are among those. And the question is, uh, when we're looking at to explain things, we often look at what we know exists. And a lot of times we know material reality exists, so we come up with some sort of a material explanation for this, for, say, the origin of the universe, for example, that you're proposing there. But what I find interesting is that there always seems to be an... So we actually export our, our awareness of material reality to something let's call it outside, that's a bad choice of a word, but logically prior to, let's say, our universe, we export that and use that as an explanation. So we've moved the notch back when positing there's a quantum reality out there and a quantum reality is still going to need its own dynamic variable, so to speak. But why don't we do the same with minds? Like we have a mind, we have, there is consciousness. Why don't we do the same? That's more of a philosophical rhetorical question here not could you give an example of what you would mean what, what would doing the same look like in that example okay so you use the word select in your model um but um we know minds can select like intelligent brains or minds they can select from a host of probabilities and options and so forth with intention of producing some effect so we know they can do that why is it so difficult for us to extrapolate that there is an ultimate mind? Now that, I don't know how much weight that carries, actually. I mean, it's more of a rhetorical thing, maybe a philosophical thing to think about, but there is something that I think proves as, as but as hard as we can prove anything, that there is a non-material reality. And I'm not talking about God at this point, I'm just talking about a non-material reality, and that is the existence of the axioms of logic and mathematics. Now, I'm not talking about, in math, we can make up other axioms and come up with all sorts of weird math. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the generally agreed upon foundational axioms of mathematics and of logic, like the law of non-contradiction, the principle of logical inference in logic, that sort of thing. So these axioms, they seem to on the face of it, exist only in minds, but yet the universe wouldn't even work without them. Like the laws of physics presuppose that there is a law of, there is a causal principle behind the, the whole system such that these laws, whatever they are, and I, Sabina Hassenfelder had a nice little video on what are these laws, and I know my physicist physics prof first year said we have no idea what they are we just describe their effects in material reality in the form of math but those laws of physics presuppose the causal principle logic presupposes well the fundamental principle of logic is the causal principle as well so if we are to take see I, sometimes i think some things are right in front of our faces but we, we we're so used to them we see them every day and we use them so much, we don't actually realize what we're dealing with here. And that's what I, what I'm, what I mean when I'm talking about the axioms. They're non-material reality that are foundational for material reality. And the moment we have identified something as being real but non-material, then this argument that there is a non-material cause for material reality suddenly gains a lot of traction. It's not just baseless anymore. Like you, you suggest that this is just totally baseless without any warrant. I say there is an enormous warrant. Our whole system of science is based on the axioms of logic and of mathematics. But we almost never worry about where these axioms come from. Well, so I would agree that if we discovered non-physical objects, then obviously using those as a potential conclusion to explain things would be perfectly justified right like if we discovered unicorns then yeah you could or leprechauns we could then use leprechauns as a potential explanation for how the gold got there or whatever um yeah, in the case haven't. of <laughs> no, unfortunately and they're not they're not immaterial either they would be oh, right, part right. of material reality well, that was just just an, uh, an example of yeah. a thing if we discovered a new thing 
or like fossils of a, of a unicorn, we could then go back and say, oh, maybe King Arthur did actually see a unicorn because there's here's evidence mm -hmm. of a unicorn. And so mm -hmm. once we discover a new kind of a thing, we can use that thing as an explanation of data uh, more justifiably than if we prior to discovering the existence of the thing. So I would yeah. agree. In the case of math and logic, it seems like the more plausible explanation is that there is no laws of logic. They don't exist. Um, no laws of inference. Those are descriptions that we impose to describe the way reality operates. But what is governing the laws of reality is the nature of the objects themselves, the physical mass, spin, charm, etc., of the objects. And there is no governing laws of logic determining these things in the physical objects. The physical objects nature is the thing doing it on its own. And there's no need to invoke non-physical laws to govern these in any way. I don't see why that would be an entailment. Um, we can just say that laws like English are things we made up. And so we can make up systems to describe the stuff that we see just fine. But that doesn't entail that the systems we've made up exist prior to or govern the the description, the things we are describing. So like we can describe um, the stuff is falling or whatever. Does that mean that um, English is pre-existent to gravity? Well, no, clearly not. Like we, we, we made up the words to describe gravity. Gravity worked just fine prior to English. And so the same thing could apply to all logic. Logic is simply a descriptor. And that descriptor could apply to the way things are and other ways that are not so like other logically possible universes but that doesn't mean logic must exist um pre-exist to any of these universes any more than english must pre-exist because i can english i can describe possible world a and possible world b and so the the language itself is transcends both universes because it can describe what's in a and what's in b but that doesn't mean that english existed prior to or independent of both these universes. It could still just be a language I made up in my head, which happens to be able to describe these things. I'm familiar with uh, one theory of the laws, or there's different theories of laws of physics, but you have articulated, I think, one possible option for laws of physics, and that is they are properties of the material reality itself. And when we do science, we're simply describing what happens as a result of these properties. Um, I mean, but that's a, that's a possibility. It's a logical possibility. So we can say there is a possible world in which maybe that's true. I, I would have problems still, though, in physics as to why is the speed of light three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, though? Like, um, is there a property of light or where did this property come from? And Sabina Hassenfelder says right out, and I, I, I agree with most of what she says, um, that these properties could change just right now. I mean, there's no reason why they couldn't change right now. Um, I, I think know. there are probably philosophical reasons they don't change right now, but that's more in philosophy. I would so, disagree there because I would think that like the fine structure constant. I really like the fine structure constant. I think that mm -hmm. the reason that the speed of light is what it is and why it is proportional in some respect to um, the other laws, I think is determined by some underlying physical relationship between the nature of the object. So I don't think it's that they could just change. I don't think they could change. I think they are determined to have a Predis predetermined relationship such that they have this relative to this other law, this other physical relationship. So I don't think they are just random or that they're happen mm -hmm. just by happenstance. I think there is a determining factor of why it's this way and not the other way, which is mm -hmm. some supervening law. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I would tend to sort of go along with what you say there, Tom, that uh, they're not just random things. There's some predetermination going on here. Uh, we might disagree on what's doing the the predetermination or the selection. But let's get back to logical, the axioms of logic, because you mentioned the possibility that they're just descriptive. But um, I would, I, I don't think we can defend that. By we, I think the humanity defend them, that they're descriptive. 
Rather, they appear to be prescriptive. That is, they're the starting points. We can't even make a description without assuming the axioms, the basic axioms of logic and logical induction. We can't even do start science. Let's say the principle of falsification in science, for example, is based on an underlying principle of the law of non-contradiction. So we can't even begin to even make sense of what we see when something goes by my eyes when I'm a little kid um, without these axioms. The axioms are a priori. They're prerequisites to be to be, even be able to make a description. Once we have the axioms in place, then we can start making mathematical descriptions of what we're seeing. Um, and that's where our, all our equations of physics come from. The, 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 the equations that actually describe material reality, not theoretical reality. So that's my objection, Tom, to the idea that they just, we just made them up. Uh, for the, the, I don't, I, I think the, they do seem to be prescriptive. And secondly, um, they don't just seem to be something we made up. They seem to be something that material reality won't even work without them. They're, now, are they properties of material reality? I don't see how science is possibly going to figure that one out without, um, they, they seem to be completely independent of anything physical. That is, magnetic fields, gravitational fields, electric fields, doesn't touch the axioms of logic and mathematics. Even mass, speed of light, that's why we can actually do um, wonderful derivations, let's say in general relativity, because we can actually describe what happens at the speed of light because um, of these a priori axioms that allow us to describe what happens at the speed of light. And when we realize that, we see, oh, there's a problem of infinite mass and so forth. But uh, that that's, I think, something that has to be reckoned with. I think we take the axioms for granted when, in fact, they may be the single, they may be the most important things for us to grapple with before we even begin to do science or begin to try and describe material reality. The other thing, I, reason that I think they, they, they're, they're broader than material reality is that we can use them for immaterial discussions, immaterial thought experiments, uh, mathematical models of theoretical universes or logical arguments that in reality the premises don't exist. And, and because we can use them, minds can use those things, not just material reality. It seems that they prescribe even how we think. They prescribe how we reason, assume, assuming we're reason, reasoning validly. Well, I definitely agree with that part. I think that uh, logic and the rules of inference do describe how we reason, for sure. But I don't see the connection to that the connection with that to what you said earlier that it this is indicative that they must exist outside or pre-exist or govern or prescribe the way things should work in the universe that part i didn't quite follow um for one example like there are many non-standard logics you know, fuzzy logic many valued logic um intuitionistic logic quantum logic things that reject the first three laws the law of non-contradiction excluded middle um the law of identity they they don't they reject those, yet they work to describe reality just fine. And so there's this, actually a section on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy called the right logic question mark. Is there a right logic? Is there one of the logics that accurately corresponds to reality more than the others? And it's possible that there is one, sure. Obviously, you would think that was like when you mentioned, are these a property of reality? I would say, yeah, if there was, if one of the laws of logic is the right logic, I'd say it's a property of some physical field of some kind. Um, but I don't see any reason to infer that the laws of logic are like that because there are, there are many different laws. Of, there are many different logics, just like there are many different languages. And so to infer that logic is somehow fundamental to reality or reality can't work without logic, I think would be wrong because it would be like saying reality can't work without English. Like we can work without English just fine. Use a different language. Use Japanese. And so you can describe everything that operates in our universe 
from a standard logic perspective, but you can also describe it from a many valued logic perspective or quantum logic perspective that rejects one of the standard rules of inference. And they could also functionally describe everything we see around us. And so I don't see this necessity that you're implying that we, that these laws must exist. And even if, say there was only one, one system of logics, even if that was the case, I still don't see why that wouldn't just be kind of like a product of human minds and why we wouldn't just stop there and instead of inferring that it's fundamental to reality, kind of like, obviously I need conscious experience to experience the world, but does that mean the world must be fundamentally made of consciousness, like idealism or panpsychism? Um, consciousness is the most fundamental thing you need you need consciousness to see the world therefore consciousness is fundamental well that seems wrong the fact that we need this tool in order to interact with the world or in the case of logic to describe the world doesn't mean that this tool is fundamental to the world it just means it's fundamental to our conceptual models so i, I would agree it's I, logic is fundamental to our conceptual models no logic no models 100 percent but why are we going that extra step to say that if it's necessary to our models, it therefore must be necessary to reality itself? That part I didn't understand in your argument. Well, you know, uh, Tom, I find one of my biggest problems in life is, is um, taking the explosion that goes on constantly in my head and trying to organize that in a way that uh, I can actually describe and uh, th we, we've run into this problem here. I would say that, um, you know, English is obviously not an axiom, nor is the English letters, because there's lots of people who don't know a single English letter and are able to describe in their own languages or their own ways. So we can actually, the problem of axioms is actually a very interesting one. You can eliminate a ton. Here's one of the, here's one of the signs that you're dealing with a true axiom. And uh, C.S. Lewis ran into this on the on uh, when he was challenged by a brilliant uh, woman, the name uh, Lady Somebody the other escapes me at the moment, to to prove the principle of uh, the the causal principle, and he he admitted after wrestling with this that he couldn't do it without using the principle, uh, the causal principle in his proof, and he gave up, um, or at least conceded that she had a very good point there, but. I'm reading this from the future and I say, but, but man, don't you realize that whenever you run into a principle or a premise you're trying to prove and you can't do it without using it in your proof, it's impossible to do it without assuming it's true in your proof. You may be, that's a symptom of an axiom. It's a fundamental premise that cannot be derived, but everything is derived from that. So, uh, and the other thing we have to be careful is when we're talking about the word logic, because logic is used in a lot of different ways in computer science, in engineering, in electronics, and uh, then in rational thought. So what are the basic principles of logic? And one of them, uh, they're actually quite simple, but one of them would be the principle of non-contradiction. And that seems to be, we, we don't just make that up. Um, and reality, why couldn't it, you know, why does it have to abide by the law of non or the, print, the law of non-contradiction? So I don't know. I've probably done a terrible job of defending the existence of logical axioms and mathematical axioms, but hopefully I can at least stimulate people to take them more seriously and to think about them. And this isn't a, a, a pursuit that I am anywhere close to being able to, I guess, describe. I do want to write an article on on the axioms because I think there's just not enough said about this. Not the ones we make up, but the fundamental ones that have to be in place before we can make up anything, before we can even make sense of what our eyeballs are seeing. Well, so that was the the one. So as I mentioned earlier, the the fundamental three axioms of standard logic are law of non-contradiction, law of excluded middle, and law of identity. And each of those is rejected by one of the non-standard logic. So many valued logic rejects um, the law of excluded middle, paraconsistent logic rejects the law of non-contradiction, and uh, I forget which one is the, I think it's fuzzy logic rejects the identity one. And so 
I say I would say those are not entailed um, in the way that we think. There are other ways, other languages, other ways people's brains could work that could accurately describe reality without the law of non-contradiction, like paraconsistent logic. You can have a, if paraconsistent logic, and if a brain worked in such a way, it would be able to accurately describe reality in the same sense that standard logic brains could do so. And so that would be analogous to the language thing where you could have uh, people who speak in English and people who speak in Japanese, and they can both describe reality just fine. And so the fact that there are non-standard logics, and quite a number of them, seem to indicate that logic is equally as much a language as English. Um, but even if they didn't exist, there, there weren't these hard examples of non-standard logics that rejected each of those different axioms, and some of them reject multiples of them. Um, that still seems to be a stretch to go that because we think in this way, therefore, this is fundamental to reality. That part seems to be a stretch because it seems to be that's what your argument is, is that everything we describe or everything that we think about has this property. Therefore, this property is fundamental. And that seems to be a dubious claim to me because simple, like everything I see is via consciousness. Does that imply consciousness is fundamental? Well, no, no. Why, why would it? Why would the fact that I see it through this medium imply fundamentality? I don't think any such thing does that. And so I don't think you can get to some fundamental principles of reality simply by virtue of the fact that they are required for us to think about things or something along those lines. That seems to be as in error as to say that because it takes consciousness to experience the world, therefore consciousness is, is fundamental to the world. I, I, I don't see why it would follow that because consciousness is required to observe the world, that therefore consciousness is an axiom because the axioms lead to other things like say cameras, binoculars, consciousness, those sorts of things, they are, they could be a secondary product of, of the axioms or of material reality or whatever. So it, the question is, is consciousness, is there any reason to believe that consciousness is a fundamental truth? Is, is it a axiom? And uh, there might, I'm not saying it isn't. There might be, if we trace it back to outside of space time to this timeless reality that you and I have both talked about, but you don't believe it's conscious. I would say it is. Uh, so there, it might be an action without which nothing could be selected, not even 47, maybe, or no laws of physics can be designed possibly, but I, I haven't produced any argument for that. I'm just suggesting that maybe I'm not denying consciousness. But when these these other competing logics are discussed about or discussed, in every case, they cannot possibly lay out an argument for their competing logic without using the fundamental principles of logical inference. Otherwise, we would just say, oh, this is bogus. This doesn't follow. Now, you can very well make up, and this is certainly done in mathematics, and, I, and it's possible in logic too, make up new logical axioms, but we have to admit, I made that up. It, I'm the first cause of that principle, so to speak. And if we grant the truth of that principle, then uh, we'll have, you know, the law of non-contradiction doesn't always work. I already used the principle of logical inference in that argument. So I, 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 um, I think the, we have to distinguish between made up um, logic or made up science fiction or made up mathematical models and the ones that are that we use to describe when we make stuff up when we when we make up an argument doesn't mean it's false or true but if we're going to talk about these things now I should concede one thing here is that we can use tools for example we can use the square root of minus one in uh, electric circuits, three-phase circuits, for example, so they have a utility, doesn't mean the square root of minus one is true or actually exists. It is a mathematical tool. And we have made up that tool, and it has a utility to describe reality, but I, I mean, I have 
uh, my prof was teaching um, electric circuits in engineering would never assert that the square root of minus one is actually true or real. It would always be a mathematical tool we use. So I'm willing to say there are things that, are, and it's a violate. It's a violate. The reason it's not real, it violates the law of non-contradiction. That's the reason it's not real. Here's something else. Whenever you see a scientific theory that violates the law of non-contradiction, you know that theory needs work. There has to be a better theory that is consistent with the law with the law of non-contradiction. And that's certainly the case in quantum mechanics. There are a lot of different theories. Or it tells us that there's a part of that theory that is not uh, accurate, and that does not accurately reflect reality. If it's actually describing reality, if it's a mathematical model, you can do whatever you want. So I, I would disagree there. I think that having spoken to some of the authors of these um, non-standard logics. I think they would fundamentally disagree. Like they do not need to posit the other laws of inference. That's literally the point is that paraconsistent logic rejects the law of non-contradiction. It's not mentioned. Well, how did they speak? Used. How did they even persuade you? Well, so it's like, um, you can build a chair out of wood. You can build a chair out of glass. You can build a chair out of metal in the same way. You can build sentences out of paraconsistent logic and you can build sentences out of standard logic. And so the speaking that they're doing from your perspective seems like it's based on standard logic, but they can build the same sentences based off of paraconsistent logic. So each of these logics builds the same conclusions, essentially, but uses a different method to do so. And so the, the alternative logics are simply showing that you don't need standard logics to build the causal relationships in the world. You can have paraconsistent logics and quantum logics where things don't always go to black and white, true or false, and they can be both true and false at the same time in multiple ways, but still derives into something that we can perceive as the world around us. And so each of these, the point of these logics is that they reject the various different laws of inference and shows that we can get the exact same world we see around us while one of those laws of inference is demonstrably false or doesn't exist, or is there's an alternative one that replaces that one. And I think that's the whole point of the, the non-standard logics. Um, now, I agree our minds work in a standard logic way as far as we can tell. But so, so I, I would ask if you could talk to the professors who specialize in this, because they would be able to explain it further. And if that was the case, if these non-standard logics could exist and describe reality without reference to, say, the law of non-contradiction, like that's the goal of paraconsistent logic. Paraconsistent logic um, is, I think, the one that does that. Then would that be a defeater for your arguments that um, logic must be necessary? Or the standard logic must be necessary? Well, I, I have sat in lectures by... Philosophers do this a lot, is, is come up with... Um, premises that we know uh, are vary from reality and then construct excellent arguments from that. But there's two things is that in every case, they will point out what we are simply going to grant. Okay. We're going to take, we're going to grant that this is true. And once we grant that, then we can create these conclusions over here, but they're always clear about that. And secondly, in their, foundational argument that whatever we're going to, let's say for paraconsistent logic, in their foundational argument, they can't even start speaking without assuming the causal principle in that what they're saying is actually going to mean something to you and that the conclusion they're going to arrive at, that they want you to arrive at, has to be arrived at through logical inference. Even if it is a conclusion that certain axioms of logic are false. That still has to be arrived at using the basic principles of logical inference. Uh, so I think they're I think, fun things to do. Well, so it wasn't that the logic, the, the point of these is to show you can start with a different language, a different system of axioms and still get everything in the world in causation and uh, reality. So it's not, the laws of logic they're starting with a different axiom this axiom is just not there law of, law of non-contradiction is there we can grant contradictions contradictions true contradictions exist and then they have another axiom 
which is includes that statement. And with these three axioms, you can get everything we see around us, all of the understanding, all of the words, all the language. So they could be speaking when they say words. They're using paraconsistent logic when they do it. They're not using standard logic. There isn't the law of non-contradiction anywhere in anything they're saying. But they can still have meaning because of the other axioms and how they relate. And so the point of these non-standard logics is that you can build a system of axioms that does not or does not include non-contradiction or rejects non-contradiction and still have sentences and still have conclusions and still have causality. And, and that's so so your argument that in order for them to stay start speaking, they still need to include standard logic, that is false. That is fundamentally the opposite of what they're doing. Um, because when they use logics, they are specifically rejecting that and showing that you can do everything without this um, axiom and using a different one, such as paraconsistent logic. So that, that would be a main objection I'd have to what you said. Yeah, I wouldn't say before they need the logic to speak. The, the, the moment they try to persuade someone rationally by let's posit some other axioms like the law of non-contradiction is false or something like that. There, it is possible, and we both in math and in logic, to to posit new axioms, and then attempt to describe everything that we see in the real world. I am, um, I, I, I don't see in them using that a lot when it comes to actually having real discussions on things. But probably the reason is this: is that um, let's go to Occam's razor. So let's posit the ones we just assume, the law of non-contradiction, those, those axioms, and we just naturally use those in rational thought and deduction and so forth. And we come up with an explanation for the world. Now let's posit some new axioms um, that maybe end up, uh, that don't, aren't based on those, that actually flat out are different from those or contradict those, and come up with a, with a description of the world. Now, which one is which is the simplest explanation that satisfies what we're seeing happening in this world and satisfies rational thought. And in that case, we go with the maybe the simpler explanation, the one that the way things work, that we've what all of science is normally based on, rational discussion is based on, mathematics are based on, rather than this more complicated one with epicycles and so forth, like you know, the Ptolemaic. Uh, view of the solar system, which it worked for predictive uh, utility, but it wasn't as simple and elegant as the Copernican system. And when we look at these new axioms of math or logic to come up with totally different ways to describe things, that's where I think we could actually test. That's my proposal to test to see in reality, I don't see them using these arguments for anything important when it comes to reading papers and philosophy journals where they're cold hard logic. They always revert to, or the papers, at least I haven't read all of them, so there may be papers out there where they're not arguing for a different logic, but they're arguing about ethics or morality or whatever the full range of things philosophers argue about in, in peer-reviewed philosophy journals. They always revert to the fundamental axioms that we just naturally think are necessary to persuade people. Now they could maybe go that other route, but it's in reality, they just don't. That doesn't falsify that by the way. Occam's razor never falsifies the more complicated explanation. But I think we need more than, um, you see science fiction is, is beautiful in that you can produce science fiction literal through literature you can produce it through mathematics and uh, you can produce it through novel logical axioms but the question is are we looking at science or at fiction or reality and i don't know that's that's a big question oh i would agree so i don't subscribe to any of the non-standard logics but if your argument is is that standard logic is fundamental and necessary to reality a defeater for that would be is is it logically possible to have a different set of axioms and still get all of reality? If the answer is yes, then that would seem to defeat the argument that standard logic is required or governs or is prescriptive of all reality. Because all you need is like, is there another alternative that can do the same thing 
If yes, well, then it's not necessary anymore. And so while I don't like any of the standard logics, I think they're silly. I like standard logic. I think it is the one that is correctly descriptive of reality. The only thing I need to do to invalidate the argument that standard logic is somehow fundamental or governs all of reality is show there is an alternative that can logically possibly do all of the things that we see. And that's what I think the paraconsistent logics and the fuzzy logics, mini value logics, quantum logics, they do that. Here's an alternative that if these axioms are the ones that govern reality, you can still produce everything we see just fine. Um, does that mean that there's evidence for this? No. Are they simpler? I don't think so. No. But that doesn't matter because the point here is simply to say the argument you presented for the fundamentality of logic is that we can't do things otherwise. But we can do things otherwise. There are other ways to do things. Um, and so that would be my first objection. My second objection is, is how does the fact that we couldn't do things otherwise imply anything about the fundamental nature of reality? That part I still haven't haven't found an answer to that question of why, simply because we can only imagine things in this system of logic, why that would have anything to do with logic being a non-physical object. I think... The principles of the basic axioms of logic are such that, um, oh, there was two things. One thing I wanted to say first before this, I just watched a video by Sabina Hassenfelder uh, a few days ago, and she was talking about the law of non-contradiction, the Pauli exclusion principle. Now, let's postulate what would happen if the law of non-contradiction is not necessary to describe reality, then what would happen? What? Why is it? Like how? You see that the the Pauli exclusion principle is just a description we make of something that really actually happens. That if it that is a state of affairs such that if that did not occur, there would be a massive annihilation of of atoms and molecules. So it's not just something we make up. It's something that the that the that the subatomic particles themselves seem to be constrained by. So we can come up with an argument for to describe reality uh, where the law of non-contradiction is not true. And for some aspects, maybe that'll work. But I don't see how it's going to work with, uh, with say, an example of the replacing the Pauli exclusion principle. That's and, and she, that, that's her point, that there is a fundamental law of non-contradiction that governs the universe, and we just didn't make it up. We observe that it's necessary, otherwise you've got total annihilation of matter here because of what happens if they do occupy the same point at the same time. And the other thing is that I, if, and I think this is a, an important point, and I think it stands, is that if we do want to present an argument for um, non-standard logical axioms, that the moment we start presenting that argument, we at least have to start the argument with the principles of, the agreed upon principles of rational thought, it, otherwise, the listeners will think this guy is totally irrational. There's no argument here. He has to start with that and then reason from those to wherever he's going to go. Otherwise, those arguments don't even get off the ground. They may end off the ground and they may end at some conclusion, non-standard logic. But to get off the ground, to even start, this is my point about logical axioms, the, the, the primary fundamental ones, to start, they must start there in a, in a, and then reason from those to something different and then import maybe an assumed new axiom. And once you start importing assumed axioms, then you are definitely freed up. You, you can start taking wing to all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Well, again, I think I would fundamentally disagree with that. And I'd say that literally the, what the, what the people are doing are saying, we are starting with these axioms, not the standard laws of inference, which are the, the three that we normally think of. And then from that, can they use these 
set of three axioms to build a comprehensive worldview or a comprehensive sentence? The answer is yes. That is the fundamental point that they are making. So they don't start with the, the standard laws of inference or laws of thought. They reject a couple of those, um, sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes add in different ones. And starting with their own particular set of axioms, they can build sentences of rationality and reason and logic and et cetera, their logic, whatever they're calling it. Um, and so that part I fundamentally disagree with. I think that I would I would claim that you got that one wrong. I think that fundamentally what they're saying is that, nope, we don't start with the standard laws of inference for this model. We start with a different set of laws of inference and can still do everything. And that's the point that they're trying to make. Um, the second thing I wanted to comment on was I'm still, still wanting an answer to the most important question, which I've asked several times, which is how does our requirement to start with the laws of thought imply anything about their fundamentality? That part I'm still missing. I don't understand why we jump from the conclusion to describe stuff we need X. Therefore, X is fundamental. That part I don't follow at all. Or I think you, the way you phrased it earlier was in order for the laws of physics to function, they need the laws of inference or something along those lines. That part doesn't make any sense to me at all. No, the causal principle. They need, they need The causal principle needs to be real, so to speak, if they're going to govern how space, time, matter, and energy interact. So what do you mean by that exactly? Because I know causation is also theorized to be emergent just like space time is in many models. So I don't understand what that is or how that would relate to the, the non-physical non -physical argument. Well, um, let's say an infant sees a butterfly go by. In fact, years ago, this is back in the 80s, uh, experiments were done with, with toddlers to um, see if there was a basic operating system that they begin with so they can even make sense of the world. And they found that they're aware that these axioms were right there from the get-go so that when you put a ball in a basket, they, they actually assumed that there should be a ball in the basket. That's the causal principle there. Now, if you put a one, if you showed an empty basket and put one ball in, but didn't let them see you put the ball in, you just showed them the empty basket and put one ball in, and then you showed them the basket and there were like 23 balls in there, automatically you could see that they had issues with this. There were problems, even if they couldn't even speak. They were, and what that showed is that the principle of non-contradiction was already embedded from square one, from day one, before they could even make sense. Or let's say a man stands up, a philosopher stands up and says, let's begin with totally different axioms of logic and then lays them out. The moment he talks to the class and says, let's begin with different, totally different axioms of logic then reason from there, which you could do, if you're going to start from scratch, lay out the things, but you cannot do that without assuming the causal principle is active in the people that are listening to you make that statement that they're actually, it's going to mean something to them. And what you said or what you wrote on the board or showed on the screen is actually that that is going to cause something to occur in their brain such that they can, that you can then move them to the next step. You can move them to the next inference using whatever axioms you've laid out. And the other thing that they're assuming is that, that when they when you assume that it means something, let's say the not, law of non-contradiction is not true, uh, you can actually, then you begin to question what does anything mean then? Because he just said this, but why isn't the opposite true? And there is an assumption that if we're going to say this is true, that we, it actually means something to us. In other words, that something that, say, contradicts that is false or doesn't isn't consistent with it is false if you're going to hold a coherence theory of truth. That's what I mean with um, 
even beginning to lay out your new axioms of logic. And that's what I mean when I say before a toddler can even begin to make sense of this world, uh, there has to be a basic operating system where the causal principle is embedded such that what they see with their eyes or hear with their ears is actually, they assume it's real. There's That was produced by something there and they look, see what it was, or they try to grab it as if that thing they're trying to grab has produced an effect in their mind that has convinced them that there's actually a thing there to grab. That's the causal principle of game. I don't even know where I was going with this, actually. I was trying to answer that question about, about being real. Um, oh, so does this prove they're real? And that's, a, that's an interesting question. Does it prove that they're real? And um, I think we could make, we could say, well, let's assume that they're not, uh, let, let's go with an argument to the best explanation in that case. Okay, I'm just making this argument up here, Tom, as I'm thinking. Let's go with an argument to the best explanation. What is the best explanation for how useful these things, these axioms are in the universe and in the material world and even in logical inference or rational thought, how useful they are? We can say they're not real, but that then whips the rug out from under our feet to be confident that we're actually having a rational discussion here. It Wait, I, mean, I, lost, I lost you on that part. So the first part I followed was, so we're trying to, what's the best explanation for why these principles are so useful? Now, so what, useful what, and inescapable, actually, it, it, at least to start our analysis of the world. I, I'm going to reject on, that <laughs> for the same reasons as prior, is, um, to just comment on what you said before. It's not that they're starting, like the law of causation or whatever can be a result of the other axioms rather than the standard axioms. You can still have causation, they still grant causation, but it's not a result of the starting, the, the standard logic, it's a result of the non-standard logic. And so they can still believe you have causation, but it's a result of these other standard, these other logics. And so they can grant all of the things you said and that they believe that what they're saying means something to you and that it's going to guide your logic in their brain but that's a result of their state of their non-standard logic and your objection that how if non-contradiction was false then i can doubt anything you're saying because it could be both true or false or whatever that part is for only like dilatheistic logic paracusist and logics don't have all contradictions are true and false at the same time, or anything can be a contradiction that is both true and false at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's only under certain circumstances, in which case there's no contradiction with me believing that what I'm saying will guide your knowledge or that what my what I'm saying means something to you, while also believing that there are some things that can be true contradictions in the universe. So mm -hmm. again, fundamentally disagree with your argument for that you require the laws of inference in order to create an alternative system of logic. But the second thing of how does this imply that it's fundamental is you were saying that we we're trying to argue what is the best explanation for why it's so useful. And the first thing that comes to mind is that for something to be useful, it doesn't need to be real or in reality or constrained by reality. So I can say like the imaginary numbers, as you mentioned earlier, don't exist. There is no imaginary number that we can like find under a rock. It doesn't exist, but it's very useful. Does that mean that imaginary numbers exist? Well, no, it just means that we can create artificial models that are more predictive or useful than real models. And that seems perfectly fine. So like, I could potentially create a model to predict where lightning will strike. That would be 100% accurate, predict every single lightning bolt. And it could be simpler than the actual physics required to create lightning. Does that mean that my imaginary model is more fundamental than the physics? No, it just means that I created a model that is more efficient at describing this particular event than what is actually taking place in reality. And it seems like an entailment of your argument is that must necessarily be impossible. It must be impossible to create a conceptual model that is more efficient at describing reality than reality itself. Because if that was possible, then there would be no contradiction with this saying that we came up with these things called the laws of logic. They're more efficient at describing reality than reality actually is. 
what would be the problem with that? Okay, I think we need to distinguish between useful and fundamental because we can come up with lots of useful things like imaginary numbers, the square root of minus one in electric, three phase electric circuits, but <clears throat> uh, that's not necessarily fundamental if we design this useful tool to be able to do that. What I mean by fundamental is something very different. It's the starting point. It's where the toddler, it's, it's like we can't even, we don't, why is it that we assume that what I'm seeing is, is actually there? No, I'm setting aside hallucinations and drug induced, whatever, but I, in normal everyday life, why don't I step out in front of a bus? Now from toddlerhood on, we, we start with some basic things. That's what I mean by fundamental is that they're the very basic, the very first starting points. They're not something we put together like a tool to explain something. They are just, the just starting clarify, point. When I'm talking about fundamental, I mean fundamental to all of reality, like physics and stuff. Like you mentioned that. So, so when I'm talking mm -hmm. about fundamental, I'm saying that these laws of logic must exist prior to humans, prior to our cognition, to our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so while I would agree that it's fundamental to our subjective narrative of the world, that that part doesn't seem important to me. What, it, what matters is, is why does taking the starting point of our perceptions and then implying this other fundamental, fundamental to all of reality thing, that seems to be the stretch I'm not understanding. How do you go from, it's fundamental to us to then go to it's fundamental to all of reality. That part I'm missing. Yeah, well, we don't know if it's fundamental to all reality and still, until we start the discipline of science where we begin to study reality and we observe that there's repeatability out there. We can actually describe what's going on in mathematical equations that actually depend upon these axioms. Not that we, we made these up, but what we're seeing or what we're observing in reality, in material reality, also we, what we're observing is that the, those natural processes also seem to abide by the law of non-contradiction and the law of, and the principle of causation and so forth. Not logical inference. Uh, logical inference is a little more complicated. I think that's important for rational thought and even mathematics. Those the, the, what we're observing. So I guess it depends on what you think is going on in science. Are we actually observing stuff out there and observing patterns and describing these patterns using mathematics and axioms of logic? Or um, are these axioms something that we invent in some way and impose on reality. And I think everything that we do in normal everyday science is, no, we're trying not to impose our presuppositions on reality. What we want to do is observe reality. And when we do that, we begin to see these patterns emerge that are all beautifully consistent with the axioms of mathematics and logic, at least the st standard ones all beautifully consistent with that. And when we see that, then we have to ask the question, well, what is going on here? What, why do the axioms seem to be true both in our own rational deductions or rational argumentation, rational thought, and material reality seems to be constrained by these as well. Now, uh, granted, we can invoke the square root of minus one to help explain material reality, but no one seriously thinks that the square root of minus one is actually out there somewhere. It's a tool, but it's a tool we invented. That's very useful because of some of the properties of imaginary numbers. So that's why I would say there, we don't assume they're fundamental to reality. We discover that they are by our observations and by repeatability and how we can describe them in terms of mathematical equations, which we probably couldn't do if they didn't abide by certain axioms of logic in mathematics themselves, or so they're not constrained by that. Well, I think this goes back to my question. 
is it possible for us to create a conceptual model that is more efficient than the way things actually are? And so if we can create a mathematical model or whatever that describes things better or more efficiently than reality, the laws of logic could be such an example. So laws of logic are describe reality more efficiently than reality actually is. But therefore they don't exist in reality. They're not a thing in reality. They're just this model that we've invented that happens to be more efficient at describing reality than what is actually there. Is that a possibility? Well, two possible answers there. Um, one is the interesting one and the one is the normal one. The normal one is, well, if they happen to describe reality, uh, then maybe we're not inventing them. Maybe they are actually components of reality that constrain how material objects interact and so forth. That's answer number one. And I think it's a good one. I think we it's it's a good site, good one to do science with is that we're not just if anything, if we're making up anything, we want to slowly weed that out of science and just see what is actually going on here. And let's help try to describe it. The interesting response though, and this is, might be a little out there, is that I don't think logic is the only aspect of reality that describes everything. Um, what would be an example? Like I think, um, Well, I found out years ago when I began to give lectures at various university campuses that if I just use cold, hard logic, I, maybe 25% of the audience like that. But then there were the 75% that I used to think were irrational, that they didn't, uh, they would just make stuff up and say, what about this and that? But then I found, I just, uh, I, I apologize for that assumption back then, that I found that actually there's other ways of of describing things, let's say beauty. So I could, I found that sometimes playing a song that was remarkably and outstandingly done would have more per persuasive effect in changing a person's attitude than any logical argument I could possibly come up with. Now, how did that happen? Just play a song or to show a painting, which is why I actually cheat a little bit on my website which, by the way, is kirkdurston.com, in case anybody wants to check it out. Every article I write, I like to find a painting that is consistent with what I'm talking about, but uh, but not in an obvious way, so that it actually gives a person a second perspective, but the perspective isn't logical. It's appealing to some sort of sense of beauty or justice or... I, I don't use music, but I wish I could. Uh, so... All this to say, Tom, that I don't think logic is the only, the axioms of logic are the only thing that run the universe. There's there's other things as well, at least when it comes to persuading. Um, and that has you know, pr principles of beauty or music or maybe sense of justice, which is difficult to describe mathematically or through any kind of law of nature. But that's... Yeah. That's yeah, I would just disagree. I would say that I think that logic doesn't govern anything. Logic describes. I would think that um, you mentioned the two options. I think it's the second option that logic is something that we impose on reality. It doesn't impose anything on us or anything on reality. And my argument for this is that logic can describe things that don't exist. Cats are dogs. Dogs are chickens. Therefore, cats are chickens. Is that true? No. No, it is not. Um, and so the fact that logic has a plethora of opportunities or things it can describe which both correspond to reality and do not correspond to reality seems to imply that this is a language, a construct that we can do to build a bunch of different options, infinitely many options, um, and only a small subset of those options correspond to reality, which seems to imply that logic isn't something that governs reality. Logic is a way that we, a system that we created that has a large enough spectrum of usefulness to describe anything we could possibly want both in reality and outside of reality. And therefore it seems irrational to think that this is fundamental to reality rather just a um, useful tool, like the square root of I that'll be my conclusion. 
Well, I mean, it, it's a possible conclusion, Tom, but uh, I would say we have to look at reality and see what that tells us about reality. And when we do, it seems that we're not imposing axioms of logic and math on reality. Rather, they seem to tell us there's patterns out there. And there's, there seems to be causal relationships between natural events, the lightning striking the tree. The causal principle, maybe we're just assuming that and imposing that on reality. But when we do experiments, we see the same repeatable effect every time. And therefore, maybe we made up the principle, the causal principle. But I think the more rational position to take is that the causal principle is actually active in how natural processes occur, take place, that it's, it's not something we made up. So, I mean, that's, it's a, it's a, maybe an abductive argument. It's an argument to the better explanation. And that I think the better explanation is, is that because of the repeatability out there, the patterns and the way we do science, it looks to us as if we're not just assuming the causal principle here. The causal principle seems to be fundamental to how nature works as far as causal chains of events unfolding and so forth. But I do, admit that you could take your position and and run with it, I suppose. Um, but I think uh, in back of our whole discussion here is the question of, um, and it's not an easy one to resolve, what do we make up and what's real? Like how much of our, our perception of reality do we make up? And how much is real? Because let's say if you're a materialist and you're right, then my belief in God actually follows in a logical chain back to the origin of the universe, uh, governed by the laws of physics and so forth. So then it becomes meaningless for us to worry about who's right and who's wrong. They're just simply uh, the state of the physical, two different physical systems completely determined with a nod to QM completely determined by the initial conditions of the universe and the, the laws of physics. But or yet random. we do seem, what? Or random. Well, but even in QM, randomness is constrained. So when you look at the decay constants, um, they're, they're actually all over the place, but they average out to some particular number and they're not way over here, over there, or they're, it's highly improbable that they will. And different elements will have different things. So even though they're unpredictable and they look random to us, there's still something constraining the probability uh, distribution of that decay. So there's still something going on there that's doing, that seems to be constraining. We don't really know that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would tend to agree there. That I don't think it's everything is hundred percent random in every way. I think there's definitely some constraints there, but yeah. Um, we have been going for about two hours. It was great having you on. Do you have, want to have any final statements or do another shout out for any books you're writing, your website, et cetera? Uh, just for my website, kirkdurston.com. And when I publish an article, uh, if you've got any comments, in fact, yeah, I, I, I like, I like critical comments. I mean, thoughtful ones. Uh, troll comments are funny a lot of times and they give me a bit of a laugh, but they're not really that helpful. <laughs> And except to brighten my day a little bit. Uh, that's all I'd like to just point to. Um, but it's been a pleasure, Tom. I enjoy discussing with you because everything seems to be polite and collegial. And and uh, it's, it's enjoyable, actually. wouldn't want to do this all the time, though, because it actually forces me to think a little more <laughs> intensely than normal. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I enjoy chatting this with, with you as well. Thanks again for coming on. Um, My pleasure. I'm going to go to bed because I have to wake up at 6 a.m. and do some chess classes in the morning. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right. Thanks again for coming yeah. on. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you. Bye for now.